that should start working any minute now. Yep, we are being recorded and we are live and welcome. This is a, a webinar that we've run a few times now and I'm happy to be back in the uh, thick of it all. Um, it's uh, Enterprise Design Impact Patterns with the tagline, you work very hard, but does it really make a difference? My name is Bart Papagai. Um, I've been an enterprise architect and many other things um, over the years and um, part of the core team of Intersection Group that is hosting this webinar. And uh, part of my journey has always been, how do I make sure that all the efforts that we put into designing enterprises, designing systems, even designing IT, actually has the impact that we're after? So let's dive straight in, as people probably are still arriving, but we have uh, some slides to go through. So as I said, this is hosted by the Intersection Group, and the uh, slogan of the Intersection Group is, we help people create better enterprises. There's a few important words there, a few keywords. First of all, uh, people. So this is for people that want to create better enterprises. Now, better enterprises is always an interesting one. We could have a whole discussion on when is an enterprise better. Um, for me, it means enterprises that actually achieve their purpose, uh, have a positive impact on the world uh, in a sustainable manner. Okay. A um, few practical things. When I go through the slides, you can use the chat window. Or, um, uh, I've opened the Q&A mode uh, to type in questions. And I probably will answer those questions at the end of the presentation, unless something really interesting comes up and I feel I have to jump on it straight away. Um, I noticed that... Um, Oh, he's gone again. I thought Wolfgang would be here too, but he probably just checked in to see it was working. Um, so I will keep an eye on the chat window and the Q&A window. And when I think there's an interesting question, I will definitely try to answer. Um, so, yeah, feel free to type in anything you like. Uh, this will be recorded. So afterwards, you can have a look at the whole thing uh, at your leisure um, and maybe even share it with people that should have been here but could have couldn't make it for some reason or another. So that's the practical stuff. Um, let me do a little sound check. Uh, can someone please type yes when they can hear me? Yeah, okay. Well, just making sure. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so we are going to do a run through of the enterprise design impact patterns. It's part of the book, and I'll get back to the book at the end, uh, that we wrote a few years ago now. Um, the idea to write patterns was based on, on basically meeting the following requirements. We wanted to write some advice on how to do enterprise, enter, uh, uh, enterprise design uh, based on real life situations. So not just a, uh, let's say, theoretical book, because as they say, uh, theory should work in practice, but in practice it never does. Uh, so we gathered together a lot of actual practitioners of enterprise design and enterprise architecture and business uh, uh, analysis and asked them, what are the typical situations you encounter? Um, how did you approach that? What was the outcome and how would you improve those outcomes? And what would you pass on to other people from what you've learned in practice? So what you get is a, uh, is a series of practical, proven nuggets of knowledge. Right? None, of, none of the content here is purely theoretical. It's really based on actual world experience. And we've interviewed quite a lot of people. So it, it's the condensation of dozens, if, if not more, people that we interviewed and, and asked them to collect and, and submit stories. Um, they're all approaches to real-world problems and solutions to those problems and situations. So what we hope that these patterns will do for you is that when you're working in the field and you encounter a situation, you can go to the book and say, okay, I'm stuck here, I'm struggling with something. What is the most uh, matching pattern here? that I can look into and, and see what the book says and then try to apply that. 
And of course, it's practice. So when you do apply it, uh, don't expect it to be a silver bullet, but it gives you some idea of how to get the impact you desire and then improve it over time. <clears throat> of course, over time, you may actually collect your own patterns and uh, become a mentor for others, which is what we encourage everyone to do anyway. The impact patterns are a little bit special compared to the other ones in the book uh, because there's a little bit of a journey aspect to this one. This is about basically entering a situation um, as a newcomer or a fresh uh, uh, engagement. You know, you're on a fresh task. You've been, uh, you've been engaged and employed or, or asked to uh, help the enterprise with some sort of a program and you come in and now your main job may be actually how to create the influence and impact that you need to achieve the outcomes that you've hired for. Because this is uh, probably the most important thing to realize when you're doing things like enterprise design and enterprise architecture is that they, were, they are going to ask you to achieve outcomes that for a large part depend on other people, right? Very little of what you can achieve, you can actually do yourself. You may be instrumental in getting it done, but you have no full control over it. The best you can hope for is impact or influence, another word for that. So uh, leverage, uh, some kind of uh, power maybe even, or uh, alliances. What we like to talk about a lot is co-creation, creating an atmosphere and a culture around you in which people like to collaborate with you and um, spread the ideas and findings that you create in such a way that everybody wants to join in and participate. So to have impact, you have to become the ultimate co-creator and even the creator of co-creation. Um, and the journey aspect is a scene here in this spiral which you shouldn't take too literally. Uh, it's not necessary to walk through all the steps from one to 11 in, in that sequence, but there is a bit of a build up there. There's a bit of a logic to how we present these ones. The idea is when you start at one, you have very little impact. And by the time you reach 10, you have so much impact that your mission is practically done. And then you can choose, you can go into another spiral or you, maybe it's just time to jump out and go and do something else. So from very little impact, building outwards till you have the impact and hopefully the results that you're after. So let's dive straight in so that we have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. The first pattern is called personal enterprise vision. And this is one that I'm actually quite fond of because we often forget to do this. The situation is that you are starting a new assignment and you want to deliver maximum value to the enterprise. You've been asked, you've been approached, and people say, well, I'm sure you can do this, and you like being asked, so you say yes. But have you actually thought it through? Because many times we find, and this is confirmed by lots of interviews I've had personally with, with people in the field, is that you are asked to do work that may not be an exact match to what is needed or what you can provide. Right. Um, take enterprise architecture, for instance. There's a vast range of domains within enterprise architecture, ranging from the top level whole of enterprise design to the bottom level of actually doing solutions architecture. And the people asking you may not know what level you're actually operating on. So personally, as an enterprise architect, for instance, I've often been asked to do work that was actually solution architecture. And I can do that, but is that what I want to do? Is that my best contribution? So before you take on any assignment, you should actually sit down and ask yourself, what is the best contribution that I can make to this enterprise? What is my vision of what I can bring? And what is my vision even of what I think this enterprise needs? Because if you don't, you cannot do much else than simply do what you're being asked even when you start realizing that that's not actually the right thing they ask you for. So make some time, have a vision, and use that to negotiate with the people uh, asking you to 
do something or the people uh, giving you the assignment to negotiate the best possible way to use your skills. That's better for everyone. It means you get a better job that's a better match with what you uh, what your uh, your skill level is and what your best contribution is in your mind. They get better work out of you because there's nothing worse than doing work that you are convinced is actually not the right thing to be doing. Um, so that's the starting point, I think, for any assignment. It's not just, can I do this? And do they want me to do this? That's okay. Th those are basic questions, but more... Is this the right thing for me to be doing right now? So take that as a starting point, your personal enterprise vision. The next pattern is when you then start working, don't presume that you know anything. Don't come in with, I'm the expert. I've done this before. I know exactly what needs to be done here. Let me get started. No, walk in with blissful ignorance. Walk in with an attitude of these people that I'm going to co-create the next stage of this enterprise with have been here doing hard work, figuring things out and know a lot. There's a lot of knowledge around, right? When you don't recognize the pre-existing knowledge, you can uh, step into all sorts of problems. You may not understand the situation uh, correctly. You may have a completely different idea of what the enterprise is actually about. And uh, discovering that halfway down the line uh, can be very painful. Um, so make sure that you do this discovery. Uh, go in, find what is already there, right? Talk to people, um, but also look at material that uh, the enterprise uh, already has, like websites, missions, uh, vision statements, documentation. Um, if you if you can talk to customers, what do they see uh, as the enterprise? Uh, how do they experience this whole thing that you're going to work with? Um, look at the products. Look at the language, so that when you start talking to stakeholders within the enterprise, you can speak their language. You are on par, well, as much as possible with with their perception of reality, because that helps to connect to them. Um, check how the structure, the organizational structures are, so especially the decision-making structures, so that you're not talking to the wrong people when you need important things happening, that you understand who pulls the ropes, who's the influencer, who, who has leverage, so that those people you may need later on. Um, if you ignore that, you may find yourself doing beautiful work that nobody's interested in, or even worse, you, you may, you know, tread on sensitive toes and the important people become your enemies, which you definitely don't want. Uh, check what's already going on in terms of change as well, because you can come in and say, I'm going to change this whole enterprise and make it better. Uh, there's probably a few people around that are already doing something similar or think they are doing something similar and may get really upset when you come in and say, no, 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 I know better. I'm the expert here. The underlying reason to do this is partially to become more knowledgeable, of course, and to find out how everything works. But it's also the foundation of co-creation, recognizing other people's wisdom, uh, you know, going to them and say, look, I know nothing. You know everything. Tell me. Help me understand that's a powerful signal that will uh, turn people's uh, initial resistance, which there always be, uh, will be some, to a, a desire to collaborate with you because you've recognized them. You've put them, you've given them some status as experts, and that really helps to break down the walls of resistance and get them on board. So don't skip the discovery phase, please. Never, ever. The next one then, following on from your discovery phase, is when you start meeting people that you think are important, that are knowledgeable, that have leverage, that are maybe already on a similar journey, you start building coalitions. Because as I said in the beginning, your work is never done in isolation. Even when you're being asked, for instance, to draw a diagram uh, that shows the future state, that diagram is useless if there's not a bunch of people around that then take that diagram and do something useful with it. 
and you need to be connected to them, not to uh, stay in your ivory tower and be ignored completely. So the, the journey here, or the part of the journey to impact here, is to be aware of the fact that there are people working everywhere and that they are very often working in silos and may not even know of each other what's going on. So become the connector. You know, find people working in, uh, in roles that cross the silo boundaries, for instance, and become their allies. Search for the people that are usually stuck in between the levels, like middle managers, uh, product developers. Um, find people that are already thinking about improving the, uh, the place, like uh, customer experience designers, uh, uh, business analysts. Uh, find knowledgeable people that may find uh, feel a bit ignored and, and elevate their status. But when you do so, ask them not so much uh, about what you need, ask them about what they need and have conversations with them to figure out how they work, what makes them tick, how they feel about things. Because the most powerful weapon of influence is to be the person that clicks with others, the person that other people feel comfortable with and start trusting as an advisor. So from the very moment you go in, become a coalition builder as much as possible. Um, it will not always be possible to get people on board, but when you have a few people on board, you, your, your clout is expanding, right? When, when you have, let's say, three or four people that believe in you and want to support you, then they become influencers of the people around them, and then your influence spreads. If you don't build coalitions, you get isolated very quickly. And what good is that? So the next level of coalition building, you could say, is to find a way to the top. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there's always a few people at the top that have the real power. Fortunately, in the sense that it mean, it's not endless, right? You don't have to convince hundreds of people. You need to convince only three or four to be your supporters. Unfortunately, is that when the, uh, the hierarchy is, is very steep, it may not always be easy to get to those people, but it is important that you have lines to those levels because that's where the important decisions are being made, where the, the money is being allocated, um, and you need allies to help you with, with that. So find those influential people. Uh, there's two ways to the top. One is the formal way, so that's actually getting in direct contact with the people in charge. Um, the other one is the, uh, let's say, the shadow way, which is the even if you can't reach the people in charge, you may be able to reach the people that influence the people in charge. So find your way to the top and get the support you need from the highest management as much as possible. Of course, it would be better if you can meet them directly. And when you do, make sure that you understand them as people, not just as placeholders or figureheads. Um, every manager, every executive is a person before they are their function. So what makes them tick? What are their concerns? What are they afraid of? What would they want from you? Uh, how, would they, how would they trust you uh, to have their interest at heart? You can do that in the form of stories. You know, Tell them what are the kind of things are that you can deliver that would really help them. But most of all, show that you understand their pain. Because when they see that you understand their pain, they're probably more inclined to open up. Instead, very often we, we present ourselves as, as for, uh, following our own agenda. And then why would they trust you? Because you're just doing your job and they don't, and they don't see that you care about them. Help them be better managers. So, so part of the change journey that you're going to work on is creating uncertainty and uh, maybe even a bit of chaos that they will be very uncomfortable about unless you give them some instruments that at least give them the sense that they have some control over what is happening. So never ignore this uh, aspect of change is risky for anyone in charge. Give them some tools to manage that risk, and they're much more inclined to support you. And then there is uh, the safe negotiation space. I will get back to that, but uh, 
there will be negotiations. There will be conflicts of interest. There will be compromises that need to be made. And very often we battle those out uh, in, in a situation that is not exactly safe. And then that's something we want to avoid. So remember the, the term safe negotiation space. It will come back in a minute. When you do this well, um, you will be seen as this collaborative force, this, this coalition builder. But you will also start getting a bit of the mandate flowing down from the top uh, uh, in your public persona that will make people more inclined to follow you and, and do what you say, because obviously you are friends with the uh, top people, which is good, right? Um, um, it's a difficult role, by the way, because you will also have to, at times, take a stand in the conflicts that happen around any organization and make sure that you have the right allies to resolve these conflicts when they arise. That's the executive buy-in, something that I feel that in the enthusiasm that we often bring to the job about figuring things out and building beautiful designs and, you know, and, and, and making sure we have the right solutions, without the executive buy-in, you usually end up in a dead end where, yep, you have the solution, but nobody's interested in actually implementing it. The next part then is to start communicating, not yet what you're uh, actually solving, but what your intentions are. And uh, it, it's the, basically your mandate or charter as you see it. And don't build this on your own. This is something that uh, you want to build with your major co-creators, the people that are most likely to work together with you on creating whatever it Need, uh, it is that needs to be created. Um, without a charter, people very often get lost uh, in relation to your job, right? Your job is complicated. It's, it's vague, especially in the beginning, and they may not understand why you are walking around and bothering them with all sorts of demands and questions. So have some sort of a charter ready. A charter built by a small group of your closest collaborators that explains your mission and your goals, um, shows how that mission is aligned with other mission documents they already uh, know, like the, the enterprise strategy or the enterprise mission, and has a sort of a broad outline of the planned stages of what you are about to create. It doesn't have to be too de detailed. In fact, it can't be too de detailed because you're still discovering a lot of stuff, but it has to have some sort of a, a, a concreteness to it that will help people, oh, okay, so you're walking around, you're doing some discovery, and then we're going to get a, a roadmap, and when, when we have the roadmap, we can going to have some plans, etc. Make sure that, that you are clear about the kind of steps you're going to uh, embark on so that you can communicate this clearly to other people as well. And then keep communicating this charter because that's what people use to form their idea about your role in the grand scheme of things. That's their reference point. That's how they will figure out whether or not you're actually relevant in their world. And of course, the creation of the charter itself is a great opportunity to collaborate and to get some firm co-creation started because it's, it's relatively safe to write a charter, but it's a good way of hammering out some of the assumptions and getting people on board and, and enthusiastic about what it is you're going to embark on. Next one, uh, I told, talked about the personal enterprise vision. The next level, of course, is the shared enterprise vision. Um, here you can play uh, an important role straight from the start, and that is that many enterprises do not have a clear shared vision because they are fragmented. They are siloed, they are disconnected, they have levels with gaps in between. And so when you look at all the initiatives going on in most enterprises, uh, there's not often uh, a real sense of the common underlying why. Right? They just get focused on the little thing they need to do, and that becomes the oh, the all-pervading purpose and, and the single thing that they want to achieve. And of course, you can get really dysfunctional uh, initiatives that way when people are optimizing something in isolation. It may make everything else worse, and they don't even see that because they're so focused on their little corner of the shop. So 
part of enterprise design is building bridges and and coordinating and orchestrating people. And you do that by bringing back the common why as much as possible. So help enterprises that do not have that clear shared vision by making it clear for them, you know, have the discussions, have the conversations and build a story that really has the why at its heart. Um, look at how the enterprise creates value for everybody or how they could be creating value. Uh, and value is not just about money. It's all the other things like experience and, and joy and, and, and satisfaction and, and growth, you know, so don't make it all about money. And uh, the, this, this is a line that a lot of people always argue about, anchor the future vision in the current architecture of the enterprise, is make sure that the future vision you are going to build for them is not so far removed from how they see themselves that they disengage, right? Present the future in, in a way that they feel, yeah, we can actually get there. I've made this mistake a few times where I was way ahead, basically, in my thinking of the future that, or of the reality that the people I was working with had in mind. And so I left them behind, literally. They, they didn't want to work with me because they thought I was a dreamer. I was crazy. Um, I made my, the, the steps from here to there too big, too disconnected in their mind. So make sure that you write a story that shows this is what we are. These are the great things that we have achieved and are capable of. And we're going we're gonna to use those great things to take the next step forward. Don't tell them we're going to change everything and we're going to be awesome. Because basically what you're saying then or implying then is you suck. And uh, nobody likes to hear that. Nobody wants to be told that they, they suck and you've come in to save them. That is a sure disengage. Uh, so tell them they're great. Tell them they're doing wonderful things. And you're only here to make those wonderful things shine even more, which, of course, would include some changes. But that's just because, you know, there's always room for improvement. That kind of storyline. Make it concrete so that you can give guidance. But don't make it detailed so that it feels that you're already limiting them in their own creativity. This is a balancing act. Your, your vision story is really a, a guide for them to start thinking about how can I, within my little box, you know, do something that will make that vision reality. Don't tell them how to do that. Tell them why it's important, why it matters. That gives coherence to your work and to everybody working with you. And hopefully that will spread through the enterprise so that more and more people have a feeling, yeah, we're on the same storyline, actually. We're, in, we're working towards the same higher goals, even though our little goals may not always look like that. And it may even help individuals to feel that their contributions matter. Because one of the other things I found as, as, as an enterprise architect myself is that I met a lot of people that had lost complete connection to why they were even doing what they were doing, right? They were told to do it and they were doing it, but they didn't actually know how that were contributed to the overall outcomes that were important to the enterprise they worked for. And that is really demotivating. When people don't feel that they make a valuable con uh, contribution, they may even start fearing for their own jobs because, hey, if I don't know if it's any value at all, they could just send me home at any, t uh, any moment. So giving people a coherent vision and showing how their contribution adds to that vision is a really good way to help them get motivated and, and, and maybe even you know, put in more energy than they would normally do. Then we come to the safe negotiation space I already mentioned before. There will be moments when you need to be put people together and hammer out some decisions, some uh, conclusions. You, have, you, you will have to bring up conflicts and see how we work our way through this. And uh, these people come from different areas, different fields of, of expertise. And the hardest part we found is to bring them together in a safe space in a safe way where negotiations are not about how can I get the most out of this uh, at the expense of everybody else, but about how can we all win and how can we all move forward in a way that is the best possible outcome for the enterprise as a collective. 
that requires negotiation skills, but also facilitation skills. Now, you may be the perfect facilitator for that, or you may have to go and find the perfect facilitator to work together with you. But this is something that happens all the time, all through your journey, that you get conflicts, you get moments where some decisions need to be made. Uh, creating that safe space, uh, I could probably do a whole presentation or maybe even a whole work, uh, full day workshop on this, is an art that you need to develop. And you need to be seen as the uh, embodiment of that safety. People need to feel safe with you, safe to air their concerns, safe to even rant and rave maybe for a bit so that they can vent some of their emotions, and then safe to explore without clinging to their smaller interest, to explore the bigger picture and see how they can trade uh, some benefits for some commitments and, uh, and how they can find other people to co-create with. This thing, I cannot stress enough, this safe negotiation space should be part of your, uh, of your skill. And it's it probably central to your skills in a lot of situations. And your position in this should always be that you do not bring your agenda to the table other than that your agenda is to find alignment, to help people harmonize their uh, contributions. You guide the whole thing in terms of the overall vision, but you're not there to pick the right solution. You're there to help people find it. Um, and an attitude you need to bring to the table here is called uh, the wisdom in the room. As a facilitator, as a person holding the safe space, your wisdom doesn't matter. Their wisdom needs to come up. I find that really hard because I love being a wise guy. So it took me a bit of practice to get there. Um, moving on, clear ownerships. This is one that uh, becomes dysfunctional very quickly when everybody uh, hides behind, uh, for instance, the somebody else's problem effect where, yeah, well, look, that's not my problem. Uh, they should fix that. Or when they have no clear ownership at all and don't even know what their mandate and responsibility really is. Um, what you get then is that people sub-optimize very quickly. They, they start focusing inwards. They break the connections and the whole enterprise design fragments quite quickly. Uh, this is almost the default situation in most organizations because ownership requires maintenance. It starts with identifying ownership. And ownership is not always the same as formal responsibility, right? Ownership is also a feeling. It's the feeling of responsibility and accountability. Uh, there's many ways you can do this. Of course, there will be committees, there will be teams, but there will even be individuals that are searching for what am I supposed to be doing and what happens if I don't and, and what happens if I do? And your role is to clarify the ownership and make sure that all the important things are owned by someone or a group of someones that people can point to and say, well, that's your responsibility. This is my responsibility. Let's see how that works together. Um, so keeping that almost tendency of any organization to fragment, um, uh, to push back against that, that's also a role that you have. And, and don't get me wrong, the, the, frag the fragmenting forces are not evil forces. Right? This is not people deliberately pushing things apart. It's just because we all have uh, a lot of things on our plate. We are all under pressure. And under pressure, you try to push away anything that looks too big or too vague or, or, or too threatening. And so without some support and without someone like you walking around and helping people to keep things together, yeah, we fragment automatically. Um, so that, that's part of your role. Uh, I call it the attractor role. Uh, helping people with their responsibility and ownership makes you an attractor of coherence. Very important not to be uh, uh, scoffed at. But it's, it's hard work because this is an ongoing maintenance thing. Ownership is not something you assign once and then walk away from. It's something you maintain and help people ma uh, maintain it. What you aspire to also is to become the foundation of the change portfolio. 
And, and this is important in a, in a very practical way, is that uh, like the responsibilities that people have, change portfolios become goals in their own right and, are, and, and very quickly move away or, or disconnect from the higher level vision that caused them to come into uh, existence. So you work hard to create a vision, a change plan, and then the plans become uh, initiatives and the initiatives are put in portfolios. And all of a sudden, all that matters to the people running uh, the portfolio and working inside these portfolios is to achieve their portfolio. And is that still the right thing? Are there crossover moments where you may have to actually drop some things from your portfolio because another uh, part of the enterprise uh, needs it more than you do or needs the money more than you do? Or maybe the markets are shifting all of a sudden and your portfolio may not be relevant anymore. Someone needs to keep that thing together and say, look, all these initiatives and maybe all these portfolios need to constantly be checked if they're still aligned with where we're heading. And if they maybe need to be adjusted when windows of opportunities close, when new opportunities arrive that we didn't know of when we put these portfolios together. Um, also very important is someone needs to keep track of the overall progress towards the vision. Um, fragmented local progress is not enough. It is important. People need to know that they're actually making progress within their portfolio, but also as a whole. Uh, one thing that I've seen a lot, for instance, is that a single portfolio uh, of initiatives was moving much faster than some of the other seemingly less important portfolios, for instance, a little bit of infrastructure uh, renovation. And then all of a sudden, the, um, the high priority, very visible portfolio couldn't move forward because the infrastructure wasn't there. And they didn't know that because nobody was actually talking about how these things uh, hang together. So you have local progress and you have collective progress, and that's not an easy job. And you want to be in the heart of this. This is where enterprise design should be the coordinator and orchestrator um, once things are moving. You're not done. In, in, as a matter of fact, your work has only just started because now you need to keep on top of this and keep helping people to stay coherent and stay on the same journey. Now, of course, if you do this, this also means that you keep working on your impact and your influence. I, I, I've made, as I said, I've made some mis big mistakes in my life, actually, as, as an enterprise architect. One was that I thought I was done once the programs were started. Um, and well, I walked away and went and did other things. And then I came back and it was a, it was a mess. Uh, not because the plans were wrong or the initiatives were wrong, but simply because the coherence had bled out of it and everybody was running off doing their own thing. So, yeah, it's important. Um, it's hard work, but, hey, you know, it's also the fun of the work. And you need influence and you need impact to do this. Almost done with the patterns. So I think it's uh, two more. Uh, one is the shepherd at realization. This is a continuation of being the heart of the change portfolio. Um, is to help people uh, get on board and stay on board, but also to help them interpret the guidance you've given them so that they can start putting in their contributions and shaping their contributions the way it's needed. This is a balancing act again, because you want people to co-create. You want people to bring in their own uh, genius and creativity and enthusiasm and energy. You don't want to hammer them with detailed requirements and detailed designs so that all they get is go and do this. Don't ask questions. Just follow the instructions, you know, follow, you know, follow the, dotted, uh, the dotted line until you're at the end. No, that doesn't work. You need to create spaces in which people can go off and, and do meaningful work. And that means that you probably should be working with all of the teams that are the realization part of the whole journey and help them stay uh, informed and help them stay connected and help and, and give them guidance. But also, and this is hard because you, you can quickly become police here and you don't want to be police. You, you want to be supporter. You want to be trusted advisor. You will have to talk to them about the boundaries, the limitations, the, 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 the principles that shape the whole thing. 
I haven't even brought this up yet, but the principles are part of what not to do, uh, but also part of how to make decisions when things get really hard. And this is where we usually stop following the principles, right? When, when just, just when we, you know, as long as everybody's happy, yeah, principles are fine. You know, as long as they're not in the way, I love having principles. But now I reach a situation and there is a principle that really uh, constrains me, that really becomes an obstacle. Well, then the easiest would be to just drop the principle. And I see that every time. Uh, so, no. Your job then is to say, well, we have these principles for a reason. We're not going to compromise on the principle. We may compromise on the execution of the principle in the sense of we may do more or less of what we plan, but the principle itself stands. Our job is to find out how to execute what we need to do without compromising the principle. For that, you need to be a very strong, trusted advisor in the sense that you need to be trusted so much that when you tell them, stop, there's a limit here and, I, and you can't go over this limit, they don't see you as the enemy, but they see you as someone who knows what they're talking about and then comes and helps them find a way of doing that without compromising the principles and, and guidance. That means you have to be pragmatic, you have to be a people person, and you have to work in a way that, that shows that you have their concerns at heart as much as you have the concerns of the whole enterprise at heart. Not easy, certainly not. Requires a lot of personal skills. I, um, just a few days ago, I worked through the pattern book with uh, someone who's very deeply into uh, organizational psychology. And he loved the book, but he said, you do realize that this requires a lot of personal skills, right? And I said, yeah, of course I do. Uh, personal skills are 80% of what makes an enterprise designer, in my view. You need technical skills. You need, you know, you need your understanding of systems and, and, and you need your understanding of, of business processes and, and dynamics. But the 80% is my estimate based on how much of your time is invested in talking to people that are in trouble, that, have, that are facing difficult situations, that are running into conflicts, that have lost the plot and don't know what to do. You don't solve that with technical uh, skills only. You don't solve that with being a good analyst. You solve that with being that kind of facilitator that gets people around the table, is trusted by those people, and then, you know, together work out how to move on from that. And then we have the last pattern, which surprisingly to a lot of people is called leaving. And I, I, I wanted this one in, in, in the book. Uh, I argued for this uh, because there may come a moment, there should actually come a moment, when uh, you're no longer fitted for the work you're doing. And there's several exit conditions that can happen. One is you've just finished your mission, right? You've done what you can contribute, and it's all running, and then maybe it's just time to move on. But the other one is more common, is that you may have uh, reached a point where you get stuck yourself, where you're no longer a match for what, they, uh, what the enterprise needs and what you can bring to the enterprise. You may have tried all sorts of things, but it's also good to keep a check on your own progress and your own situation. And from time to time, ask yourself the critical question of, am I still in the right place? Is this still the right engagement for me? And then the hard part is to say, okay, maybe it's time to walk away from this. Maybe it's time that someone else tried. Because you can put a lot of energy and time and, 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 uh, into forcing or trying to force the situation. Um, it doesn't help you. It doesn't help the enterprise. And in fact, it can work against you in the long term because uh, when you do this, you easily become an enemy, both of yourself and the people you're trying to work with. And that will be remembered. That will follow you around. So make sure that you have some sort of an exit strategy and keep checking with yourself. Is this now that moment that I want to leave? Or is this that moment where I'm just, you know, taking a little step back and, and regroup? If you do decide to leave, never see it as a failure. I mean, there's no failures in life other than the ones you don't learn from. But see, okay, why didn't I succeed? Why did I reach this point? And what would I do differently next time so that next time I will succeed or have a much higher chance of succeeding? So leaving is part of the game.
And nothing is forever, not even being an enterprise designer or having a job uh, in an organization. And we should probably learn to be more flexible and more comfortable with the moments that we have to leave. And now I'm leaving the patterns. So a um, little bit of uh, time maybe to ask questions um, before I do the closing slides. Um, so let's, let's take 10 minutes for some questions and answers. And if there are no questions, then either I have been so clear that no explanation is needed, or I may have missed the mark completely. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone with questions, please? Any comments? Uh, will you run more webinars? Yeah, absolutely. The, there's webinars for uh, all of the chapters in the uh, pattern book, all of the, the segments, I mean. And uh, I will show you a page uh, in a minute where you can find which webinars we're planning. Uh, so there's all series coming, don't worry and uh, practice and creation patterns are definitely in there. Are there any other questions? Someone's typing, so. What are the tips to get the right roles in the organization? Um, the, getting the right roles uh, starts long before you actually get the role. So what I found helps is, is three things. First of all, do some, you, know, you could call it spying, um, do some asking around, um, uh, talk to people that have influence, talk to people that know the gossip uh, so that you become aware of what's cooking um, in the enterprise. Then uh, reach out to some of the more powerful players and have conversations about their plans and concerns uh, Loki, just trying to figure out things and, and don't push yourself forward too much, but show that you care about them. A very powerful trick that, uh, that you can do is ask some uh, major player, like even an executive, uh, even the CEO maybe, to mentor you. To say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, walking around here wondering what I can uh, do here, but I don't understand every detail of this organization. Maybe you can fill me in. Making someone your mentor is a very powerful way to start uh, uh, them to see you as, as someone they can trust and they can help. So don't expect people to just give you a role. Find out where the role uh, uh, sort of in potential, uh, in, in, uh, is that in potentia exists for you to then shape it. The other thing you can do is to start behaving as if you already have the role. When you feel that there's some useful thing for you to do and you'd love to be assigned to it, then ask yourself, well, how should I behave if I have the role? And, and show people that you are already there, that you're ready for it. This is fake it till you make it almost, but walk around as if you're already this, the, the chief enterprise architect or the chief enterprise designer, and people will start believing you are. And then the role falls naturally to you. So that, that's, that's, that's some of the things. But first, first do your spying in, and, and reconnaissance about where are the opportunities and which of those opportunities is most suited for me. And then emphasize your suitability for it so that you attract the role. That's probably the best way you can, you can do that. Um, and um, practicing the skills is, an, there's, there's always opportunities to practice. Don't, see don't wait for the big opportunities you know there's small opportunities when when there's a conflict show that you're really good at facilitating in conflicts when uh, there's uncertainty and and doubt be the one that helps people to figure things out so practice all the time is is my advice here work with people as much as you can uh, okay, now then, uh, easy question is, will a recording of this session be shared? Well, Wolfgang will be very happy to hear that this time I did press the record button. So, yeah, there will, this will be shared as well as the slides. Um, ah, good question. What strategies to suggest when you're actively being suppressed within an organization? Well, um, it's still on screen, right? If, if this goes on for too long, you may have to leave. Um, actively being suppressed by an organization can become so dysfunctional that there's no way out. But 
First of all, see active suppression uh, as a sign that you may be onto a good thing because any change that is powerful and, and deep enough to be worth doing is also threatening enough uh, for people to start pushing back at. Uh, the, this is an unavoidable uh, part of the dynamics is that changes that are safe people will let happen, uh, but safe changes are also not very valuable in the long run. The really valuable changes cause resistance, and then you need to work on the, the underlying reasons for the resistance. So when people suppress you, don't ask yourself, how can I get rid of the suppression, but ask yourself, what are they clinging to? What interests, uh, concerns are they protecting that maybe I can uh, uh, work with? so that they don't feel so protective anymore. It's called working on the underlying concerns. For this, you need to talk to these people. You need to, to have regular interactions with them, and you need to figure out what is it they're protecting, and how can I help them to stop protecting this particular thing and maybe get them focused on something else. Don't just explain the benefits. That's one thing that never works. You can explain benefits till you're blue in the face. You need to really get them to uh, release the fear and let go of that fear of losing something precious. And then you need to find something other, some, some other precious thing that they can focus on instead that they will get if they work with you. And, and again, this is a whole workshop that I would be glad to take you through. But first of all, suppression could be a good sign, right? It could mean that you're, that you're pushing so hard for valuable change that people get scared. And then don't try to talk people into uh, supporting you. Find out what they're protecting. Okay, then I get uh, a nice compliment about tip two. The, uh, I don't even remember what tip two was. Uh, that's the uh, pre-existing wisdom. Yeah, okay. Um, the, uh, should the set of impact patterns uh, change somehow if it is being applied, not in the, but in a sort of collaborative org? Um, yeah, I'm not sure they will change depending on the hierarchical nature of the environment. Um, I've worked in organizations that were uh, either extremely hierarchical, extremely flat. You may change the order a bit. Uh, you may change the kind of coalitions you build in a very uh, collaborative, almost self-organizing organization. Your coalitions will not necessarily have any formal aspect to it. But you will still find coalitions with the more influential people, the you know the the, the people that are better at, at at keeping people together. The, there will be natural leadership even in a very non-hierarchical organization. So you want to align with the natural leaders, um, but be aware that in a non-hierarchical organization, this is usually much more dynamic. So your work will be more dynamic too, right? You you cannot become too formal and too, too stuck to certain formal arrangements and say, no, no, this is all done on paper. Look at the org chart. In really collaborative organizations, this changes all the time. So you need to be flexible. You need to move with the waves as they go. I've done both and uh, both have advantages and disadvantages. Um, I personally like the informal side of, of highly collaborative organizations. But it can be a headache too, because you know uh, there, there's the risk of constant debate and a constant desire to to uh, uh, bring up decisions again and again and again, because everybody wants to have their say. So yeah, there's challenges there too. Um, thank you, uh, Verena, for the compliment. Um, what tips can you give for quickly diving into the subject matter of the enterprise? Well, uh, the pattern has some tips. Um, I usually start with looking at the website and some of the documentation. Uh, it really helps if you can get some customers, right? Just see if there's some, some representative customers that you can talk to and, 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 and talk to them about the experience they have with the enterprise or that particular part of the enterprise that you're engaged for. Um, when I have a chance, I like to talk to the executives and, and just get them to give their perspective. And then I like to talk to some employees and, and match those perspectives and see how big the gap is. 
that for me was one of the best ways of, of understanding the dynamics into, uh, of the enterprise when the story the executives tell me is very different from what the employees tell me. I know that there's a lot of work to be done. When the story is well aligned, there's still a lot of work to be done, but it's different, right? Then I know that we're already on, on, uh, off on a, on a good start. So talk to different stakeholders, get their perspectives. Um, but also don't, don't hesitate to dive into the documentation that exists because there's always more than you think. One thing that I did very successfully in an insurance company, I found a librarian, someone who was collecting documentation and he's been, he, was, he was there for 30 years already. So I, I just went to him and said, look, what should I read? And, and he had documentation on everything. So find the librarian of the enterprise. That's maybe a good tip as well. <laughs> um, do you have a tip when employees want to do more, but the top management is little active? Um, yeah, that is, um, and I, I see I need to start rounding off, but when, when the top is inactive, you can do a groundswell movement, but it's, a, it, it's harder and you have to be more careful, but you can create local successes that start uh, uh, getting attention and start creating this kind of, oh, I want to be in on this. This is too good not to be involved and, and suck uh, the attention of the management towards you, as it were. Be aware that this can also backfire when you become too successful and people see it as a threat. But there are ways of starting from the ground upwards. Okay, I, I am obliged by contract to do a little bit of the closing slides. So I um, want to say that this was part of the Intersection Group's initiatives. We are a nonprofit uh, association. We have uh, things like uh, Edgy, which is our uh, tool in development, a language that I can highly recommend for everybody. We have a, a thriving community. We organize events. And from time to time, we sit down and actually write a book. And so the pattern book is the first one. And the, this is what the webinar was based on. It's a book I can highly recommend, of course, uh, having been part of the writing. I am not entirely objective here, but I'm sure it's a good book. And it's fun to read. And we, uh, we have, we've gotten a lot of good feedback on it. So if you want to know what else we organize in terms of webinars, uh, you can go to the uh, intersection.group events page and you'll find all the webinars listed for the coming time. And as you can see, there's uh, uh, stories, there is uh, mapping, and I don't see the next pattern webinar uh, here yet, but I'm sure there will be. And if not, then uh, reach out to Wolfgang and he will tell you exactly when we're going to do those. Big event happening soon, soon-ish, in September in Vienna. Uh, highly recommended. And, of course, uh, this time it will be in a fantastic environment. Wolfgang promises a palace and, and chandeliers and I don't know what else. But uh, this is a place where all the fun people meet and all the creatives. And you really get a chance to talk to other people in the field and, and start uh, exchanging uh, experiences and maybe even join our, in our effort to create better enterprises in a sustainable and, and ongoing manner. Um, whew, that brings me to the closing slide. I want to thank you for being here. I hope it was uh, worth your time. And if you have any more questions or comments or want to participate, please reach out to us, reach out to the intersection group. You can also reach out to me personally if you have further questions. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much.